a tight spot to level out and make a brave move. First tries fly, most need to take two. So slow down some, hold your tongue, take time to load your gun, and eventually, yeah, finally, yeah. All right, well, episode four of the single point of view, um, we have the wonderful Hunley Hofer with us, and we got Jordan, Jordan Webb on the other side. How you doing, bro? Good, I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, That's it. How are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. I, I can't complain. You see this happy, smiley face? <laughs> I'm smiling so much, my cheeks hurt right now. <laughs> I'm giving a lot of golden retriever energy at this moment. I'm just really happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, the long overdue, honestly. Mm-hmm. We've, been, we've been talking about this for a while to get you on here, and uh, finally we're here. Um, and you're obviously all the way across the world in Canada. Sadly, we, we miss you over here, but sadly, tis what it is. I mean, honestly, there's times where I'd, I'd rather you be over there, but it's okay. We'll, we'll take it as it comes. Um, so, how are you doing? What have you so, been up to? Yeah, I mean, how am I doing? Well, it's already March, which is insane to think that it's already one year since this whole pandemic really took her first steps. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's been like a year of accelerated growth for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm at a point in my life where so much has happened in the last year from so many directions that I'm finally feeling the dust settle and I'm back in a new groove and I'm really vibing with myself with the lessons that 2020 taught me. So Mm -hmm. to summarize, like, I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling like the, the, I wouldn't say the brunt of it because we're still going through it, right? It's not over, but the brunt of it is kind of getting to a point where we've learned from it and we're getting to a comfortable spot, I feel like. I mean, Singapore is doing better than most. I know how, how it is in Arizona. I actually don't know how it is in Canada right now. Yeah, how is it in Canada? I mean, right now we're, we're, like, we're in a gray zone out in Toronto right now. So Does that mean? Still, it's, still kind of, we're still, it's still kind of tough, honestly, out here. It's definitely nothing like in Singapore. We still can't go into restaurants and eat in there. Uh, we still we're still not allowed to be in groups of even eight out there playing or whatever the case may be. So right now it's it's whatever. But I'll be I'll be leaving to go to Spain, so I'm good. <laughs> mm. When do you leave? End of the month? Huh? Do you leave end of the month? Yeah, I leave on the thirty first. I'm going to Madrid for a little preseason. You know, so I'll be be out. I've never been out there, so I want to see how it is. I, I wonder how it is out there in terms of. Uh, COVID and all that. I don't know how, how bad it is out there. Do you know, honey, since you're like half European? <laughs> well, as I am the expert on Spain, <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> they're covid <laughs> sure. They I. I mean, no, I think they're fine. Honestly, what I see from my friends' photos, like, yeah, there's everyone. I think the whole world are still wearing their masks. They're also still social distancing. But the fact that you can play sports there is a bigger step than it is in other countries right now. I mean, Singapore, you still can't play in groups on teams yeah. that are uh, bigger than eight. So only football, yeah. only football in Singapore, right? I think the oh, that, really? yeah, the Singapore league is so that started, so they're playing. Yeah, they're playing. Oh, I didn't know that. That's so unfair on every other sport that <laughs> requires ridiculous. a team. It's so <laughs> nonsense. I mean, I have, my, I have my reasons on why I think it is, but I'll, I'll save those for... Yeah, so it has to do with money. It's gotta ah, be. Wow. It's gotta be. There just has to be. Like, I mean, you have 11 per side, mm-hmm. plus the coaches and the refs and the subs. And the, well, you have ball boys on the side, too. You know, now, now like, I think I they mean, just put uh, the ball on the cone, and then, then they leave it. There's no ball boys anymore. So who's putting the ball in the cone? So like, like it could be an official that puts all the ball there. <laughs> the ball. They put the balls all across the field. So if the ball goes out, you pick up the thing and then that's it. And then like probably an official will come take it and put it back. But are they all wearing masks when they're offside? And when they're what? When they're offline. On the side, on the sideline. Side <laughs> See, this is how. <laughs> <When they're laughs> is like a specific. <laughs> <term>. Yo. <laughs> As soon as you're outside, just throw your mask on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yo, no, um, no, yeah, all the people on the um, the sidelines are all wearing masks. Yeah. Every, yeah. Cute. Yeah. So okay. The, yeah. So it's a. They need to open up basketball. Then I'll be all right. If it's just basketball and soccer, I can let it slide. But or football. 
basketball you have to travel so i guess that's why they they don't do basketball but i think with singapore it's just uh in Singapore, so maybe it's... Yeah, you kind of do have a safe bubble. You're not, you know, Like Brunei, his, the team from Brunei didn't join the league, right? They're still out. Yeah, yeah so... Yeah. That's how it goes. All right, so... Let's, I think let's segue to this question. Let's get... Okay, so we have a question for you. Um, being native Singaporean, mm -hmm. right, we feel like this is a term that everybody's definitely heard, um, but sometimes people don't really know what it means. So... Um, we're going to ask you this question and we want it to be something that we, that we continue moving forward just because we want to see how, how people feel about how, how people feel about Singapore, but also if they know this answer. So um, yes. you've heard of Madula Singapura. Yeah. Right? Do you know what it means? I would say, you know what Manjula means? Because I'm sure you know Singapore, right? What? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> uh, no. Manjula. Okay, hold up. Give it, give hold it a up. shot. Okay, I'm, it must be something like, like praise Singapore or like I belong in Singapore or like something <laughs> very like national Nationalistic pride, sure. you know? What is it? It's onwards Singapore. Onwards yes. Singapore? Yes, I had to look it up yesterday. I didn't know either. I'm not going to lie to you. Oh my God, Han Lee. Yo, my God. I had so much faith in you just now. Yeah, we, we had a little deal. I was like, I bet she gets it wrong. Because there's so many people that have said this, but have no... Oh, I did not know that. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to ask every Singaporean I know from now on. <laughs> you ask other Singaporeans? No, you're the first person apart from just us talking about it last night that I've asked. Oh, wow. But I genuinely didn't know it. Um, for people that don't know, it's the, it's the national anthem. Um, so Majula Singapore means onward Singapore. It's the national anthem, and it has a... A whole history behind it. it actually was written in 1958 um did, did a little the little research okay so. facts <laughs> like 1958 yeah, yeah. like geez <laughs> <laughs> my mom was a year old uh, <laughs> i'm dating her <laughs> so um yeah but most people don't know what it means so we, we thought we'd, we'd check on that but the main question we want to get to is what does singapore mean to you what has it meant to you in your life based on just your upbringing like what you've been able to hear when you travel yeah I oh around. man i i mean i am so proud to be singaporean because we are an exceptional nation we are a young nation but we have also achieved so much in such little time and to grow up being singaporean and to feel our status change in the world as i grow up with it is truly an honor you know i remember when i was younger and i would travel and i tell people i'm from singapore nobody knew where the hell that was people were like what isn't that in china how come you speak english so well you know like and it was it was sad but true no one knew and then we went to that through that phase where singapore got a shout out in pirates of the caribbean and everyone was like it was oh the it's it's from the, like. yeah, yeah people were like oh singapore like the pirate movie and i was like no we're better than that and then <laughs> we're more than just that the fisherman's village yeah and then people started to be like oh singapore crazy rich asians and i'd be like no we're still better than that and then it was like singapore oh you guys have the best passport in the world you guys have one of the best economies in the world you guys are a startup capital you know yeah. you guys are a multilingual nation and suddenly all this like international street cred poured in and um, yeah, and, and it just kind of made me feel proud to be a part of that process. Mm. So now going off what you said, like even growing up in Arizona, being dark skin with curly hair, they'd be like, oh, you're from Singapore, aren't you? Is that Chinese? I'm like, bruh. Yeah. Like, of do I of look all Chinese? the places, like that shows how ignorant you are with yeah. what Singapore is. And it really wasn't like just Americans, but obviously Americans aren't the best well known at you know, knowing their geography. I had no clue what Singapore was until 2009. Until you showed up, huh? No clue what, I didn't even know it was a country. I'm just being honest, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you see where we, you see that, you see the trajectory that we've gone on. I mean, even thinking about when my parents, like my mom was growing up from what she saw and now where it's at, it's, it's ridiculous. But, um, so what we have for you, which we, we don't have as with us, but we'll, we'll definitely get it to you, is a June water bottle. Um, it's a water bottle that's, yeah, there it goes. You can see it right there. Oh my god, I love it. It's How a, smooth that is. It's self-sustaining as and it's self-cleaning. I mean, so you tap that bu button on the top, put water in, and it cleans out in ninety seconds. How does it do that? It has a, a black a UV light in it. Yeah. So yeah. 
Oh, that's a game changer. Yeah, so you'll, any water you want, oh, put it in there. And I'm, you know, I'm loyal to my water bottle because it's hot in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> it's <is> humid. <laughs> Okay. okay cool. Yeah. No. It's it's awesome. Come on. Thanks, guys. Of course. Shout out to Tom. Tom Shout out to Thomas Beatty and June. Appreciate it. But uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get that to you, and then all yours. Even though you didn't get onwards right, you terrible Singaporean. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> You're horrendous. And you, you know the funny thing is, while you were going on saying word after word, I was just like, oh my gosh. She was going to four, five, six, getting it wrong. I was like, I've lost this bet now, man. I know that was in your head too, now. <laughs> When she said pride first, I was like, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a close one. Onward. Yeah. Right, Onward, I'm, single. Now, I'm now testing everyone I know. <laughs> so who who are you? For somebody we talked about you being Singaporean, but like what's your what's your background? What's your what's your story if you if somebody were to give it to you? Okay, ask you to give it if to someone you. were to ask me who am I, I would tell them that I'm uh Singaporean Chinese mixed German, based and living out of Singapore. Um, in terms of what I do. See, I do a lot of things, so it's always like a long, like, see, I never have a simple answer, right? It's yeah. like, where are you from? And I'm Singaporean Chinese German. <laughs> like, that's a long sentence, mm -hmm. you know? And then people ask, like, what do you do? I model, TV host, act, host a podcast, Instagram, influence, like, a lot, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, it, it's hard. I, to be honest, when people ask me that, sometimes I just, like, lie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I work in Google. Like, no, <laughs> just like simplify it like what do you do sales like, <laughs> <laughs> like just so oh, that i don't goodness. have to give the spiel um no but i i work in content creation mm. i guess under every avenue i started my career working for mtv as a tv presenter i graduated did radio for a little bit whilst also doing tv hosting i did like um modeling throughout i've been an actress like still consider myself an actress and now I'm like I produce my own podcast yeah I think all these jobs they're hats that I interchangeably switch up yeah depending on what projects I'm working on so yeah I do a lot yeah. I, didn't, I didn't really notice it till now but I feel like all those things you named are all based around your personality as well of being I mean you're not you're not always you know outspoken and you can be reclused and relaxed but I think that you've always been a, a presenter in your own way. Like you know how to to be, I guess, what's the best way to put it? You know how to put yourself out there and that's with podcasting and acting and mm -hmm. hosting. Like you need to be a personality. Yeah, right. so, so media personality. Yeah. I know, I just feel weird calling myself a personality. People are like, what do you do? I'm a pers media personality. Yeah. But it is the correct term. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of, it's, it kind sums of, it up, but it also feels like it leaves it quite vague. Right, right. Yeah. I would, I would like, cause you were talking about that, I'm like, so, you know, when you were growing up, did, was it like you, that's the type of person you were? Or did you have to, like, you started getting into these things and you became that? Like, I don't know. I feel like, so Navin and I, for you guys listening, have known each other his whole life. True mm. story. We're old, old friends, man. And I don't know. I feel like this element of myself having a lot of outward energy mm. has always been there. Mm. I've always been a bit of a goof of an entertainer. And I just think I found the right career to complement that without having to suppress my authentic self. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite fitting. Do you feel like that's something that you knew you wanted to do as a kid, just having those personality feels? Or is that something that just kind of came to you and you're like, oh, this works. I'm I, good at it. Yeah, I think I always wanted to be in, in the entertainment sector. Um, but figuring that out along the way was exactly that along the way. Mm. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. All right. Well, I mean, you you spoke about like, you know, being a model. So I, I've I always wanted to ask you this, and even my family wanted to to ask you ask you this too because I've spoken about you and all that because of obviously getting about to do the podcast about you and they wanted to, wondered and I was wondering as well is like, did you have any setbacks like being a model? Because for us looking from me looking from the outside, it's like a model has to have a certain look, and does that kind of how does that affect you in the, in the real world? Yeah, I mean, to see the term, the modeling industry has completely evolved in the last five, six years because of social media. But mm. when I joined 10 years ago, that didn't exist, right? We were, it was still very much superficial. I mean, it still is, let's not pretend it isn't superficial. Um, and so 
being a certain size and a certain look mm -hmm. was a necessary tool, you know? And I think that's it. Like, I think it's to recognize that beauty in whatever standard, because there's so many types these days, yes. is a tool, is a tool. And, and it's how you use that tool, right? Um, and I think having the clear distinction of that from an early point helped me keep things impersonal because as a talent, as a model, when you're putting yourself out there, you are your own product. And so people reject you, you can take that quite personally. I'm mm -hmm. sure you can relate too as an athlete, you know, like you are your work. <laughs> so people don't want you, like that hits hard. Mm -hmm. So I think to be able to distinguish who you are versus what your tools are and like kind of separate these things is a huh. useful is a useful uh, asset to have. But yeah, I think the setback at the beginning was not having that distinction of me and my job and me and my look and me and where I put my value. And I think as I've aged and I've, I, as I've like dispersed my value to beyond my looks, that's helped. But the biggest setback that comes in between any talent work or individual work, and, and I know it's corny, but it's true, is your own mindset. You know, it's like the limits of what you believe about yourself. If you have confidence in yourself, whatever size you are, whatever look you are in uh, industry like modeling, you can achieve. Like you can make it. it it's it's really up to you and you backing yourself. That's it. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I mean, I feel like with, with football and you know me being an athlete, you know, if you get cut or you get, um, you know, you don't get selected or whatever for a team. You know, it could get, it could, it can, it can really get to you. You know what I'm saying? I think Navin, you must know about this, right? Because I mean, it was something similar. We were never been cut in my life. No, yeah, like I, it, it can really. <laughs> it starts now. Leave I'm cutting you from your own podcast. <laughs> it, it can, it can get like, it can get super tough. I, I when my first time, I tried it with it for a team. Uh, I don't know if I told you this, Navin. I was about ten years old. Um, my mom brought me to uh, some team, Oshawa Kicks. I tried out for the team, and I got cut. Like I got cut. Like I and and like I was devastated. Like I was like I, I can't play soccer. You, you know what I mean? Like that whole, like I was just like I can't do this anymore. Like you know what I mean? And I was like ten. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was ten. So like imagine when you're trying to when you're being a perfect, you're, you're a pro, and if someone's like you're not good enough on our team, you just wonder how 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 tough that can be for a person, right? So you gotta have some, at least some mental toughness. Yeah, exactly. Especially, I actually think that's so true, especially when your career furthers and you are a pro mm -hmm. and you're still not selected. It's, it doesn't get like easier, but you're able to not sit in that space of rejection for longer. It still sucks, you're like, damn. But then I, know, I now know better to be like, okay, move on. Whereas yep. when you're younger, you sit there longer, like I suck. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. That's that's yeah, that's the type of mindset that you gotta have now, especially, you know, even bad games you have, you gotta be like, okay, that was that's I have to look forward. Next thing, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, I guess I know exactly what you're talking about. I think you spoke you spoke to me about it once when I was, you know, preparing to try and join the slingers and whatnot. You're like, you have to go into it with the mindset that you're obviously good enough to play and whatnot. You gotta go into it believing that. Cause if you go in there doubting yourself, then you're obviously putting yourself at a disadvantage right out of the gate. But more so, you have to be prepared that although it's a sport, in its own way, it is an, an art form. Like, same thing with your presenting. Like, nobody's going to be able to go up there and do it exactly like you do it, right? So it's, I think sometimes we forget that, like, for example, a painter would have somebody look at their art and say, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. But then somebody would look at it and be like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. But exactly. it's so perception-based, and only one person could have made it exactly like that. So your game based on whoever is critiquing it, good or bad. You can't just say, oh, because it's good, it's correct. Because it's bad, it's not. You have to also take both with a grain of salt. But yeah, that helped when you explained it that way. Like going into the trial, even if it didn't work out, I know that one, it's not final. And two, it's it's some individual's perception of my game at this current step step in, in my in my life. So you don't want to hold on to it, you know, too much. But um so you spoke about joining MTV first and that kind of being your leap. And I remember that. That was fun. You came to, to California with us. We had a little snippet in, in the show. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, Honey, Honey had uh, Nisha and I on, on her show 
um, what was it, just doing like a vlog of yeah. Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was dope. Um, but yeah. now, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this at some point. It was pretty cool. Why am I only hearing this now, though? <laughs> Look, you, 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 you feel like giving it to you. That's why. <laughs> you only get bits and pieces, baby. You don't know it all. Whatever, you know? man. <laughs> so with MTV being the first jump and then seeing kind of how our TV has kind of like gotten stale in comparison to how other things are now, right? Is, and you've adjust, adjusted and adapted amazingly, actually, but has it been weird to look back and be like, that's where it all was, like everything was in this medium? Yeah, man, for sure. The weirdest thing is that it happened so quickly. Mm. It's so quickly. Mm. Like, I joined MTV when I was 21, and I'm 28 now. It was not that long mm. for there to be a whole 360 in terms of content creation. So I, I look at it nostalgically, but it also definitely trips me out that... Mm. It feels like a lifetime ago, and yet it really—it was bare. It's ba yeah, it's bare. It's been like seven years, yeah, which is really not close. that long in yeah. terms of personal timeline. Um, but yeah, thanks for saying that. I've adapt adapted well. No, you really have. Yeah, definitely. I think I think it's, you know, it's like, okay, so that's the thing that we need to always remember. It's like we need to evolve with the times, right? Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of my girlfriends and I are like. They're all Instagrammers and they're all my age group and like TikTok's coming up, but they're like, I don't want to join TikTok. It's for the young people. Like it's for younger people. And I'm like, no, that's a, that's a bullshit mindset yeah, to yeah. be like generation difference. Like mm -hmm. you're going to end up being like, look at people who use Facebook. That's the older generation. That's what they said about Instagram. Now yeah. we're saying that about TikTok, you know, you need to evolve and keep up. Yeah. That's and also like age is nothing. There's no generation difference when it comes to tech. You can be on top of it no matter what age you are. You know. That's actually good. I didn't. I didn't really think about that because for me, I, I don't have TikTok, but all the kids that I coach use it, and I think because I see them as kids, like, and I'm around them all the time. You're like, okay, well, I'll, I'll let them have that. That's their little. Because as soon as you jump, you feel like if you jump into a space, it almost makes it less cool. Like if all our parents were on MySpace, probably wouldn't have been on MySpace as much, right? So. There's that, but then at the same time, we're not so far removed from that. It's not like I'm a parent. It's not like I'm in my 40s and 50s, so I can still, yeah, yeah. you're not out of the loop to a point you're where you need to. You're not out of the to, loop, man. Yeah, yeah. We're not. So you're you about to get TikTok then? Like, what's up? Don't, don't yeah, do what? it. No, I love TikTok, okay? <laughs> I think it's a lot more creative than Instagram. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a little video with you, big girls walking, and you picked TikTok over Insta. Yeah, TikTok's fun. So you really feel you really like you really like TikTok more than Instagram, like that's a fact. Like, or you, or you, or you. I thought, yo, okay, controversial, right? <laughs> because I, I, I love, I like Instagram for sure, um, but TikTok is more creative. What you just have more freedom to do more things with it. It's not like just a picture or. A yeah, 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 it's just more creative. It's, it's, I. That's the best way to describe it. Once you guys really get in on it, you'll see what I mean. Yeah, my my nieces are on TikTok. They're oh my lord, my niece and my 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 sister oh they be doing this tiktok stuff all day like all day you remember you see natalie's tiktok i swear i see what she had so oh, i don't know she had some mannequin doing some i don't know what she was doing yo but yo it's hilarious though it is funny though so i can only imagine because even her she's quite creative with all of this stuff and she's like 14 you, you, you see the young kids like they're super creative what they're doing it's they crazy they when you talk about create and they're like we're talking young we're talking from like eight nine ten eleven tw like you know what i want you to try something with with your niece uh the youngest one when you when you get a second because i did this with one of the kids that i that i coached and they actually did it where it's you ask the younger generation show me what it looks like to take a photo and they they do that like the kid did this or he did this and but they don't they don't do yeah they don't do that they don't do that bro they did this okay i'll one up you <laughs> It's, um, how, how do you pick up a call? What do you guys do? You do this. Yes. Kids do this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta try it. Right? Yeah. We're like, I'll call you. We do the finger thing. They do the mm -hmm. It still looks like that on the app too. Like it's still a, like the phone app. Yeah. It's still a phone. So I don't know how you don't, I guess they've never really, they don't hold them. They don't. Imagine a kid trying to do the spinny one they'd oh be confused God. i was, I was confused as a kid sometimes i was just about to say that that spinny one that, that thing was quite dope though like i would still use that phone today i would use that right now definitely <laughs> so speaking about adapting where do you see yourself in five years from now because obviously seven years you've seen the jump and it's probably hard to predict 
-hmm. but more so where would you based on what you do know in the industry where would you see yourself in five um i would like to still have an online presence for sure mm -hmm. i think that by then as well it would have adapted it would have grown with me um i don't think i will ever truly slow down with creating content and putting myself out there um in terms of the type of content that I'll be producing and putting out there, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't say for sure right now. Um, it goes with the time. It right? goes with yeah. the times, yeah. but uh, I definitely will still be, yeah. You'll still be. A, a media personality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. I mean, have you thought about that with your industry? I mean, I think that- I think I told you, I, I wanted to ask you the same thing, but like for me, I think I only have a few more years left in playing. You know what I mean? So I'm probably going to play about three more years because obviously I want my family to see me play and, and all that, right? So I want to be a police officer, like I told you, right? So I, I think my transition will be from, you know, playing three three to four years. And then during those years, I'm going to be trying to transition into when I'm done to being a, a police officer and then try to be a, be a homeowner, right? Like I told you, I want to get, get, a, get, a, get a place, so that'll be super important for me. So in the five years, I guess that's my, you know, if you're talking about that's like a short term goal, three to five, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if I'm being more like specific, I do know that right now I enjoy, so I consider myself above all things, a host. That's my, my true training. With MTV, I hosted weekly TV shows. I've hosted radio shows. I host live events. I've done interviews. I host a podcast. So I think I would like to see myself in a position where I still practice that, but maybe the topics that I'm talking about are more in line with what my interests are. Like I'm interested in holistic living. I am interested in spirituality. I'm in a very seeking season of my life where I'm interested in, I don't know, just learning about, I guess, more philosophical topics. Like, who are we? Why are we like this? Um, so who knows, maybe I'll lean towards that direction. Do you see yourself starting yeah. another podcast or would it just be something completely separate? Because um, your podcast right now, just so we're clear, in case you haven't heard it, people oh yeah, listening. Plug, plug, yes, plug. Yes, just so we're clear. <laughs> great, great podcast. Um, it's it's really centered around women and, and, and those kind of topics, right? Based yeah, around... I mean, it's, it's a very honest take about femalehood. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's me. It's a very authentic approach. Uh, our audience liken it to just like a hangout with their girlfriends yeah. talking about real deeper topics with like a very casual approach. Mm -hmm. um, and we also interview people really to also learn for ourselves, right? Yeah, so maybe in line with that. Okay. I don't know if it's a new one. We'll see. Five years is a long time. It is, long time. It, it is right? What about you, Nav? What about you for five years? What do you, where do you see yourself? Maybe? Well, coming here, I came in at 25, I'll be 26 this year. Like, obviously I wanted to play professional basketball, play for the national team, and I figured that this is the window to do it, right? You're young, you, you still have, you got your degree now, um, and you can, you can kind of live a little before you say, I'm gonna go into the corporate world or whatever it may be. Um, so my goal was in those five years to play basketball and just see how far I can take it and how much I can do with it and how much I can set up on the side while I pursue something that doesn't feel like work at all. It's, it's just fun. Um, basketball, he's quite bad. You know, I've beaten him a bunch of times. He's probably the worst player I've seen in my life. Same. Ah, oh, the cap on this Same. Act. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different now. That was when I was 24. <laughs> um, but now that COVID is what it is, like I'm, I'm flirting with other ideas on what I want to do in the next few years. So, I mean, I'm I'm not married to any of my ideas going into things. Like if I if I feel like something is changing around me and I need to adapt in order to to be happy doing whatever I'm doing, I'm willing to do that and, and change my plans. So um, as of right now, I'm still letting it rock and I definitely want to play. And I think I'll give it until July-ish, our birthday time and, and see where COVID goes. But then at that point, I think I'll be willing to make some adjustments. So not too sure what yet, but definitely, definitely thinking about those things. So, and then that will change with my five years goes. So we shall see, we shall see. You know, you were talking about all your work, Hunley. There's another, there's Thing that I wanted to ask or bring up. What did you take in school? Like, what did you take in school? Did you take, uh, I don't know, what is it, business? I, I studied psychology, English, and art at a higher level. Mm. Uh, those were like I, 
I well, I did the I, I, I did the IV. <laughs> International baccalaureate. Exactly, it was hard. Um, I just passed. Just. That's pretty good though. It's, it's <laughs> not easy to pass. But I didn't actually go to higher studies because I took a gap year, and it's become ten gap years. <laughs> a gap decade. I like the new term. Coin that. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> okay. And then what what was your what was that like so when you took the gap year you had a plan in terms of like you knowing that I'm not gonna probably go back or like I always I've always uh, listened to my instincts and I'm a firm believer in going with your gut. And my gut always knew that I'm someone who benefited from learned experiences and I always felt like I was gonna get more value from the world and throwing myself out there than uh, than studying necessarily. Mm -hmm. And that was that was me. I mean people are different. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy I listened to my gut. I was never really one to be studious. I actually suspect that I've got like a attention disorder because I really can't focus. The fact that you guys have me this long in the podcast is pretty like, for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I followed my gut with it and no regrets. No regrets. Do you feel like you learn about things that you want to learn, but sitting in, the, in, a, in a room and learning about something that it's just being told that you have to learn is a whole different feel. Because you, that's what I felt growing up. That's what I felt growing up. Um, I'm not going to speak on what a higher education is like because I, I don't do not know. But for me, yeah, I, I'm much more able to apply myself when I'm in a surrounded situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like you do. You definitely still look to learn, right? And that's something that I talk to a lot of my family members about all the time. Is like. Whether you choose to go to school or not doesn't shouldn't dictate if you're learning or not, right? And if you're not still actively trying to find new things to learn about, whether it's your interests or whether it's things that you want to pursue down the line, whatever it is, then you're whether you go to school or not, you're not going to be successful. So you like school people equating school to success. I think it's now starting to be an old thought, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you see it, you see that it's very very plausible for you to not go to school and still be successful, mm -hmm. but. I think it's the people that say, okay, I'm not in school, but I'm still going to put this learning in overdrive, which is probably what you did. Maybe you felt like I'm not going to school, so now I have to do even more to to not really compete, but to make the people that think that school means that I'm successful. But, you know, so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. There was, I mean, I, I think that I am a bit of a competitive person, you know, and I think especially when I'm younger, those feelings were a lot more raw. So I definitely had a, I'll prove them mm -hmm. kind of agenda on the side, but not anymore. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And how, how did your parents feel? Because I know some, some parents will be like, if they're not going to go back to school, they might give you like, you know, give you the side eye. Like, what are you doing? Like, how, how, what was their approach when, when you told them, or I'm not going to be? Um, they were supportive. Mm-hmm. Supportive. My parents are, they are very, they have a very hands off approach. Mm. My brother and I. Um, and so, yeah, they were supportive. They were like, just, just make sure you do something, do something with your life. They're, they push us to constantly create and to search for ourselves. And I mm. think that's a very valuable type of parenting. I mean, I, th I do you get like a lot of parents? Oh, I mean, there's some parents that. If that were to happen and they get on their kid, you, you like that stuff? Like for, for you, Nav, and like, or any of you can answer this. So, you know, if say I'm dropping out of school, then your parents would be like, oh, you need to go back into school. And they're not really caring about what the what your, the kid might actually feel or be like, I, 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 I can't go to school. It's not what I love. I like doing something else. But they force them to be um, like, a, like, you know, a student and try and get the degree or whatever. Do you, do you think that's good or what? I think there's a time and place for all of that. I think there's a time where you're, you do need a strong hand to tell you, hey, you need to be in school. You need to do good in school. You need to you know, apply yourself in extracurricular activities. Like my dad was, was huge. Anything school related, my dad took care of at our house. So he was the one that was telling me to go be student body president and, and, and try and be captain of this and do these different things that were bigger than school because I wouldn't have known to do them otherwise. Like I wouldn't have known how important they'd be for skill building, for whatever whatever you want to look at, like I wouldn't have known. So in those moments, I'm like, yeah, you definitely. I'm glad. I look back. I talk to him about that all the time. Like I'm glad you forced me to do that because it taught me a lot. But then when it came to real decisions, I'm talking about like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, okay, you just graduated high school. Do you want to go to do NS? Do you want to go to college? 
what do you want to do? They weren't telling me this is what you should do. They gave me their opinion on what they thought was the best, but you got to give your kids the freedom to make mistakes and make their own choices. And even now, after I finished college, like most people would be, especially with business law bachelors, they'd go to law school. Here I am in Singapore trying to play professional basketball. So like you can, you can usher your kids and teach them the skills at a, at a young age, but at a certain point, they're going to do what they want to do and they'll resent you for it if you don't mm-hmm. let them do that. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a balance. That's how you're going to be with your kids. You want kids, honey? What's up? Yeah, I'd love to have kids. Definitely. Yeah. Do you know when or it's more like a happens yeah, to happens? Yeah, I'm going to be in my early 30s. My mom had me when she was in her early 40s, which is quite late mm-hmm. for a woman. Yeah. Um, so I had the experience of having older parents in that sense. Mm-hmm. And they always were just tired. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. They just like always wanted to nap all the time. Yeah. And like my parents a big age gap and so my dad was just like sleepy <laughs> and i i, I want to be able to play with my kids <laughs> like a grumpy cat just there chilling <laughs> they're just tired all the time they were, they were just like oh it's 4 p.m time for a nap and i'd be like playtime <laughs> oh lord did you know <laughs> what did you say i said was your parents like that too or what yeah my dad my dad was probably napping all the time when he was in his 20s he naps like a like it's a profession and my mom is the opposite like she wants to go do things all the time she's always like i mean now she's gotten older she's a little bit more recluse but yeah she, there it was good because my mom as you know is like let's go do this let's go travel here let's go see that and then my dad's yeah. a relaxed one so we kind of they met in the middle most times and i'm a pretty go with the flow type person so i really just yeah we do what we do <laughs> oh all right so um so what's your what you know what's your biggest success for until now in your life? What do you what do you feel your biggest success is? Uh, I have a lot of successes, you know. Like, the biggest one. Give me give me the number one. The number, number one. one. Oh, person that comes to mind. I'm I'm successful in regards of my freedom. I'm my own boss, you know. Like mm-hmm. I have managed to carve a pretty comfortable life in uh in an expensive city. Let's be real. Um, I dictate my own timeline. I can travel whenever I want. Um, I have, yeah, financial freedom because of the work that I've put into myself. Mm-hmm. So that's my greatest success. Great I truly have what I consider free. Like mm-hmm. I'm free. Yeah. That is a wonderful answer. Wow, you came with a you came with a deep one. I was gonna think you would say something else, but damn. That's a good one. That's that's the goal, OD, I guess, (laughs) who we're trying to get to. (laughs) So that, and that's something that has been that way for a little while now, too. It's not like it, like it happened overnight or it was, you know, like a one, like this year or 2020, like you you kind of slowly but surely chipped away. So that, that, so that has always been the biggest driving force for me. Mm. I, value freedom so hard that like every direction or every choice I make in my life is like has that in mind like Mm. will will this will this hold me down you know will this like limit me you know these are the questions I ask myself um and that is why I think I I didn't want to go down the uh conventional route of going to uni and stuff because the prospect of spending my life in a classroom to end up working for someone else just like made me ooh, have heebie-jeebies, right? Obviously that statement itself can be interpreted however it wants. Cause yeah, I know that there's, you know, there's pros and cons, but at the time that was my driving force. And yeah. so here I am, I feel I'm successful in that. And I think I'm good. That's worth it. Mm. Yeah. What about you, when you, when you decided to play pro, was that something that you said, okay, well, this is what's gonna give me the freedom to to do something or was it something that you were like well at least i won't be back home you know hanging out with, with certain people what what was the main reason for you saying i'll go do this and take this quote unquote risk i mean it really is a risk right you don't know if you'll make the team you don't know what may happen so um for me it was i think you know my thing Navin. like i i didn't want to because at that specific time in my life it was like when i was going to go back home it was rather me go back home to like pretty much nothing or go to Singapore, right? Like, I didn't have much option, you know what I mean? It was, and I was like, I, I think I'm gonna take this risk and, and um, 
you know, just try and become a professional. Like I've always wanted to, to, to do that. Right. But I didn't, I had a choice, but I didn't really have a choice. You know what I'm saying? It was rather me staying home and just not like have nothing or, um, go to Singapore and try and make something of myself. You know what I'm saying? And I, People didn't really want me to go. They were like, yo, you should stay in school. Just remember you were talking about, you know, like, that's why I asked that question because my mentor wanted me to stay in school. And I was like, I don't like school. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's not for me. Um, like, I can I can apply myself, but I just feel like I'm not, I don't know. Some people enjoy it and I didn't really, I just didn't enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I, and I want to, I, I want to go and do something so I can help my family, so I can help my, you know what I'm saying? Like, help myself so i don't think it was really a choice so just me taking that leap of faith and, and then um becoming a pro i was just becoming a pro was just my biggest one of my biggest success things in my life because it, it really changed me you know what i'm saying like for the better because i don't know the people that i've met out there everything you know what i'm saying so um yeah i guess just me becoming a pro really honestly that's huge i mean that's a huge success Definitely, unbelievable. You become a professional in a field, and, and to succeed the way that you have in your yeah. career as well, like you, you ten years, what eleven seasons, or is it vice versa? Eleven seasons, ten years. I don't know. Yeah, eleven seasons. Okay, eleven seasons, ten years, thirteen goals, a <laughs> hundred something goals. <laughs> um, but no, you're you're right because I felt like although it was a risk, as you said, you didn't you didn't have much option. You'd be surprised. I mean, I'm sure you know. There's a lot of people I know back home that had a chance to go play ball in India or some random country like that they, they've never really decided to go to, and they chose to stay home because it was comfortable. Mm. It wasn't even safe. It wasn't like the safe option. It was like, I don't know what that's like out there. I don't know if I'll like it. Like, I'm, I'm good. I'll stay here. I can do whatever I'm doing here. They're like, why, why would that be the better option for you even if you even if you don't work even if it doesn't work out you always have you can always come back to this right yeah. so why not and that's and that's a mindset that not everybody has so you you have in that mindset i think is really that's that's powerful to so hopefully that now that you're in canada you can you can you know show some of the youth that as well watch him stay in spain speak fluent spanish <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lied to me said he spoke his right have me you know <laughs> he told you he spoke he's <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> this guy told me, told me he spoke <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and no, no, look at he believed it. This gullible piece. So of I believed it because <laughs> other people that I didn't know very well told me that he did, and they spoke Hebrew. I didn't believe him, but I, I trusted them. Could you believe that? Could you believe that, Hunley? Could you believe that this this dude really believed I spoke Hebrew? Oh, good. Such a piece of shit. <laughs> oh that's so gold <laughs> weeks i think i found it like a month after <laughs> oh, man, that's great. can't trust this man okay so this is something i really wanted to talk to you about mm -hmm. because jordan and i've had these conversations we've i've had a conversation with my friends in in the states um and i think it's a it's a topic that unless you grow up with it you don't really understand how it works and it's having a helper in the house who honestly we don't like we don't think of our, the people that were in our house as helpers whatsoever. Like I had Auntie Lynn, you had Elena, Auntie Lynn, like her entire, yeah. yeah. So like it's, it's literally a, a connection in, in such a unique way that people yeah. don't really understand. So maybe you can yeah. speak on that. So I want to clarify that because this is the experience of growing up in a house with a helper, mm -hmm. right? Now other terms for a helper is nanny, an outdated term would be made, which mm -hmm. we don't use anymore. Growing up, though, we used that. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and we, that term aged out with us, which I'm happy about. Yeah. Um, because it's more than that. You can't put a label on a person who is basically a maternal figure in your life. That's what they are for, for us. Um, and I understand in the West, when you say that you have nanny or helper, you know, there's a certain class associated with that. Yep. But in Asia, and not just in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. it's a very common thing to, mm -hmm. to have a live-in helper. It's, it's very common. It's not an upper class uh, status. It's a middle class status as well. And, and so once uh, people understand that it's traditional, okay, there's that base, but also understand the humanness of it. 
people come into your house, they raise you, they pick you up from school, they bathe you, they feed you when you're babies, they play with you. The bond becomes so thick that it's it, they're honestly your family. Yeah, genuinely. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the times, and Jordan, maybe you can speak on it because we've spoken to Donovan about it, and he said that like he feels like it's not that it's wrong, but that it's it's almost like demeaning. And we're like, it depends on how you treat people, right? Because there's definitely situations, and I'll, I'll be the first to say I've seen it, where these these helpers and these these extensions of the parents when the parents aren't around aren't treated like an extension of the parent. Whereas in our house, that's how you had to treat them. If I were to act up to my Auntie Lynn and my mom found out about it, which she would, it would be just like if I raised my voice to my mom or my, or my dad or anything like that. It's, that. it's that much of a, of a respect factor that you have to have in the house. And that really goes back to the parenting more so than it does it's who hard. you bring it's in. It's horrible, though, because we there, you can't get into this topic without definitely highlighting the shadows of it. Mm. So also um, in terms of a cultural explanation. So when when helpers come and live in, they're normally coming from impoverished countries, right? So Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, like they're coming from poverty. So they're doing their bit to make the best for their family, right? So they're coming from free choice and free will. Yeah. Um, But yeah, definitely in the household, you have cases where it's just heartbreaking to see how ego and power play and dynamics can really turn people into the worst versions of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's what Donovan was going from because he, he was just going off of like hearing the horrible things that happened and thinking that everything, everyone, like most of them is like that. And that's why Novin came and spoke to him about his experience with it. You know what I'm saying? Because I think a lot of the people back here, back home here, like that's what it is, right? You have to really experience it before you just go and talk about it, right? So they just hear that, oh, you know, someone's coming there getting paid like peanuts, right, to do whatever. But some people get paid a lot, some people get paid a little, but it's maybe a lot for them when they bring it back to, the, you know, their homeland. Um, but they can send they can send money home, still survive so here. Elena was with me my whole life. Um, she lived in Singapore. She was with my parents before they got married. Like she's wow, been with my that. dad for years, looking after him. He she eventually married a Singaporean man. Hmm. Uh, Uncle Bujang, who, rest in peace, passed away last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Beautiful man. They had a beautiful marriage for 10 years. She converted to Islam uh, for him. They moved back to the Philippines together. And with her life earnings, she sent three kids to higher education. She built two properties. She's now a business owner out there. She's a landlord. She's like, she's a landowner who rents her property out to other people. What? In That's one, big, and in, come yeah, on. come on. That's... And she and she grew up in the countryside. She's got like nine siblings, like poverty. And in one lifetime, in one generation, she was able to accomplish so much. She changed the trajectory for the rest of her future family. You mm-hmm. know, like people need to understand that. Yes, they're on the surface level. You can look at a at a household and be like, oh, you guys have a helper, whatever, and judge that. Yeah. But go deeper and understand the dynamics at play. Definitely. Definitely. I think it's something like you said, if you if you don't if you don't experience it, you don't know. But then also if you don't take the time to open your mindset to what you've been kind of indoctrinated to think, then you're also kind of s- stuck in the mud because mm-hmm. it's it's one thing to not understand something. It's another thing to not want to. Mm-hmm. So and I think a lot of the times when I've had these conversations, people people are telling me about it as if they've experienced it and not that they've just heard about it. So it's kind of a. Yeah, you got to be open to it. Yeah, I mean, when we were, when I think me and my sister were growing up, we was in the apartments. I think we never really, we never had that, right? So what we would have is, I'm sure you know, maybe your next door neighbor would take care of you if mom's not around or dad's not around or the your, your auntie that lives on like the eighth floor. <laughs> you go over there and, you know, you're there with her or whatever it is, right? Like, so like we never experienced, like I've never experienced none of that. My first time seeing that was in Singapore, which was, um, eye-opening for me, of course, right? Just like the toilets being, uh, <laughs> the toilets being, oh my, say what? You love you them squatty potties. You love those ones. Them squatty potties, man. Like that, like, you know, it was, bit, it was different for me, but, um, you know, you just got to open it. <laughs> oh, you caught it. I just got it. I just got it. Uh, what is he? Oh, toilets? <laughs> the flat was. <laughs> never seen those in my life like that like it was i was i, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall just to <laughs> see your face of like what do you mean go there <laughs> and there was no tissue he had to use the little 
Yeah. It's probably wet. Hygienic red, by the way. It is. It is, Hunley. I felt violated. I felt violated. You felt violated. Yo, my first, <laughs> my first time using that, man. Yo. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Now I can be up in there using that all day. I'll tell you that right now. Now you're buying a bidet for your new home. Say what? I said, you're going to get a bidet for your new home, the little booty sink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> My sisters, when they came up with it, was like, yo, this thing is so useful. Like, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> the wide eyes. <laughs> oh, so one thing I really wanted to talk about since it was just International Women's Day, um, and it's a topic that we feel like we don't know enough about, which is that, I mean, you, you live in a house full of women besides your two nephews, um, and all of them are, are pivotal in your life. Me, my mom and sister are huge, as well as my cousins, you know, some of my closest friends. You go down the list. Like, there's women in both of our lives where we genuinely couldn't see the world without them. But, and we're obviously, I mean, I wouldn't say obviously, but we know we're just not the people that are per, uh, perpetrating the, the negative side of things that men have done to women over the years and continue to do to this day. But we spoke and we don't feel like we're the solution either. We haven't been doing things to push the envelope forward or apart from, you know, maybe a, occasionally there's a conversation where we feel like we put our two cents in, but men just don't have these conversations amongst each other enough for these conversations to really have the weight that they probably could or should have. Mm -hmm. um, so as a woman that's not only, you know, has her own podcast that revolves around empowering women and having these great conversations, but just as a friend of ours and you know us, like what would be something that we could do, um, and I mean really do, to feel like we're doing more and, and actually helping? Oh, God, I love this question because I think it's so good and the timing right now is critical. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the for you guys to admit that you don't know if you're part of the solution either, I think is huge. I don't think a lot of men would say that mm -hmm. because they will sit comfortably in the space of, oh, but I would never do that. And that's enough, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To be like, but I would never do that. But the first step, to become a true ally to your female friends and relatives is to monitor the conversations that are had about women when women are not in the room. I'm talking about locker room talk. Okay, when you accept a culture of locker room talk, that is like words, words have such power, right? And words are the beginning of any major movement or action. And if you're in a situation and what I mean by locker room talk is you guys already know what I mean by locker room talk. Yeah, yeah. You guys know. I don't even need to go into it. It's the stuff that I said about women when women are not around. It's to be the guy in the room to say, don't talk about women like that. Don't say that about her. Don't use that word. It's to nip it before that word turns into a thought that turns into an action. And that's it. That is to just the, the simplest way to be part of the solution. Mm, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, do women do the same thing? To what do we bad mouth men? Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's a different degree because women don't, are not violent towards men. You know, like our thoughts and are, can only to, can, only, can be limited because at the end of the day we are, there is still so much inequality. Like we can moan and bitch about our, our brothers, partners, friends, and but I don't know any crime that has been that has started from that to a woman like being violent or uh, disregarding her male counterpart. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are, I'm not going to yeah, cross that out. Though. But the trend is that it's the violence towards women, right? So when, when we have these conversations with a guy and let's say he says something and we're like, hey, you shouldn't say that. You know, like, for example, I equate it to, let's say that I have a friend that, that thinks that using the N word is, is okay. Right. And then when we tell them, hey, don't use that, what what's to stop him from using it when now we're not in the room? Right. So like where at what at what point do you feel like you've actually gotten through to somebody or are you just censoring them for a time period? Right. Oh, probably have to educate them a bit. What? I said probably you have to educate them a bit, like actually sit down and, 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 and talk to them and tell them and give them why and all that. Instead of just saying don't, you probably have to explain why and, and all, that. all that. But you can keep going. But also, I was gonna, I mean, that's a very, like, that's a very democratic answer. 
because I was going to say shame them, (laughs) shame them, because I don't think there's an excuse these days Mm -hmm. to be ignorant with your words, you know, like, I don't think that whether it's towards race, gender, um, faith, that we are so educated, we have so much available to us, I don't think that people can take the choice of like, I don't know, Yeah. shame them for not knowing, Yeah. like, whatever, we're we're going through so much, we're a modern society, shame on you for using that, shame on you for not wanting to know more. And there's no way you don't know. Like, there's enough going around. Yeah. Information is literally at your fingertips. You yeah. know. Now, some people may argue and be like, shaming is going to make it worse. It's going to mm. cause resentment. But, hey, that's my answer. There's parts of me that think that there's a moment in time where you want to censor somebody or not really censor them, but, you know, just... Yeah, I guess, I'll just use censor. Yeah, censor them because maybe whatever they're doing, for example, Trump, with a lot, a lot of the things he was doing was inciting violence, inciting certain things. There's a time and place for that. But then there's also times where I feel like Somebody is so wrong and we just kind of let them disappear into the darkness to still do what they're doing rather than using them as an example. Like uh, Donald Sterling, the Clippers owner that did all those things and said all those racist remarks and ended up having to sell his team. He sold his team at a profit. He disappeared into the darkness with two plus billion dollars on top of whatever he already had. And nobody talks about him anymore. And I feel like if you're a billionaire racist guy as well, you're going to be like, Things could be worse, mm. right? Like, you're not going to say, oh, I definitely don't want to be like that guy. I don't want that to happen to me. It's like you, you've you you've pushed him out into the darkness and you haven't really used him as enough of an example to say that anybody that does this, this is what happens with you. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, shaming, I think, does have a have a role. Yeah. Because right? you, you need to be punished for certain thoughts. I, I think so. I, right? I, 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 don't, I don't think that you should just be, oh, everybody has freedom to think. Hard. No. No. Like, Absolutely, I absolutely like there. Like peace is more important than your freedom sometimes, right? That's a real Singaporean mindset to have as well, which I love. That is an Asian. Oh my god, COVID hasn't taught us anything. It's the real split between a Western and Asian mindset Mm -hmm. of security versus independence. Yeah. Right. Like people out here in Asia, like yeah, it's uncomfortable, but I'll wear the mask if it's for the greater good. Whereas in the West, you see those idiots that are like. It's my right. <laughs> yeah, we are right. Damn. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Are we all in over there? The gray zone? The Twilight zone? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the only thing that I'd really want to talk to you about is, is something that we both, I guess, share, which is that we're half Singaporean, half something else. And a lot of the times, it feels like you're... You're Singaporean, a lot, and a lot of the times it feels like people don't accept you as a full Singaporean. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, and you God. get this this 50-50 feel of, yeah, you're not really Singaporean, though. Right? Oh, 100%. And, all, and you've lived here your yeah. entire life. I mean, for me, I think it's, I, I give them a little bit more leeway because I've been gone for most of my life, and or at least half, and there's there's a lot of me that still is very American. But for you, for that, like it shows that it doesn't matter what it is, it's about the mix. Oh, That's yeah. what it's about. So for you, have, have you felt like it's changed over time? Has it gotten better? Um, my, my attitude towards it has changed mm. for sure. I mean, growing up, I definitely, I mean, I, I, I consider myself Singaporean yeah. and that's my meaning. And if someone else doesn't, that's their meaning. And I'm not, I'm not trying to prove them otherwise because mm-hmm. also there is no such thing as a singular like type of Singaporean. That's mm-hmm. what makes Singapore Singapore. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up, I've had instances where people are like, prove it, show me your pink ID or... Uh, I, I, yeah, I have people like, prove it, show me, show me your pink ID. And then when I show them, they're like, oh. But <laughs> even then it's... Huh? So that was anti-climatic. Yeah, I'm like, what did you think it was? And it's like, <laughs> fake. <laughs> like, <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> Um, what about an international school? Did you... In the international yeah. school, I was... It's getting, you hear that? It's still just ruggish around here. Bro. I don't or, to tell you what <laughs> Just let me just get it out there because I wanted to tell you this, man. Let me just let me just Oh you did yeah, you did have a story for me where, oh, yeah. where he was out here thugging. Yeah. Um I was going to pick up Anthony. Um because I I don't know, I was just going to meet him. I wanted to uh, get the poster that's in the background right there, second point of view. Thank you, Jordan. Um so I was going to do that. So I'm, I'm on the highway now, which is called the 401. Um, I see the cop behind me, a, cop, a policeman's behind me now, right? I'm in the fast lane. 
So I'd like move over because maybe I'm thinking he wants to go past me. Like I move to the next lane. He goes into the next, he follows me, obviously, right? Boom, puts on the light, puts on the sirens, whatever. Turn up, go to the side. My four ways, chilling. You know what I'm saying? Chilling. He comes in there, he's like, yo, um, do you have your license and, and your registration for the, I was like, yeah, this is a rental car. I'm in a Dodge. I'm in a, a Dodge Charger, all white, Okay. So yeah, can you see, uh, can I have your license and your registration? Or I seen that you had a rental, so do you have like the registration, whatever for it. I gave him whatever I had in the car and my license. He, go, he goes in there, I'm waiting. I'm there kind of panicking because you know, you sometimes just don't know, right? Like with police. Then they came, he came back and he's like, all right, so we just had a complaint about there was a, a, a white BMW. No, I'm in a Dodge Charger, okay? Said a white BMW. Then I was like, all right. Um, then he's like, yeah, there was some complaint. On, I just followed you on the from, from the highway. I was like, all right, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't have a BMW. And he's like, oh, okay, let me let me just go and see if uh, the rental is thing again. So he went there and came back. Then he's like, oh, sorry, uh, the guy was white. I was like, what? <laughs> Yo, I, just like this, he's like, the guy was white. So that's that. I was like, all right. And then he's like, all right, take your thing. And then he left. So the whole time, like the whole time, like, yeah. So he basically got a complaint that the guy was a white guy in a BMW, but decided to pull me over because obviously I'm a black man in a Dodge Charger, right? And then he, know, he knew, like a Dodge Charger is it's not BMW. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, like, it's pretty obvious. So I don't know Even why. If you don't he know what a Charger is, you know what a BMW is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know why he, he decided to pull me over because he's seen that I was driving a nice car. And you know some, you know, like maybe he can get one. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that was kind of just messed up for me. I didn't, I didn't like that at all, bro. That was today. That was today. Jeez. Yeah. That, do you ever feel? I don't know how the cops are in Canada in comparison, but if there's one thing I can say is every time I've had an interaction, besides maybe once or twice with a cop in the states, I feel less safe. Immediately, pulled over, stopped for something. Immediately, I'm like, all right, I'm on edge a little bit, like automatically. And they they don't give you a reason to feel like the one or two times I'm saying that I feel felt better is because they give you a reason to feel like okay, like this is he's being friendly now. It's all the rest of the times they're like, yeah, you better be on edge. Like that's the that's the energy that they give you. Like you act up if you want to, go ahead. I like, give you give you a shot, shoot your best shot. And we're like, and I'm I'm the friend that's always the most you know. I feel like the most well-spoken when it comes to any situation with a cop. I'm the one that's always going to like try and defuse any situation that may have like have happened. But there's still no. It's like oh, you're you're one group bunched under one thing. So just also the fact that he was like, I'm sorry, he was white. Like you're admitting to your racial profiling <laughs> right there. You're literally being like. Oh, my first instinct was to go for the person of color. Like you're literally admitting it. Yeah. Like it's just, it, it's just, it's, I mean, I feel, I have so much sympathy for when I read about these encounters in the West and when I hear you guys share about it, because I don't, I can't imagine what kind of stress that adds to anyone's plate to just have that, a possibility for that to happen any minute, any time, any day, mm -hmm. and you're in a place that's your home. And yeah, I, I didn't feel like when he, when he pulled me in and then he said a BMW, then I was like, now he's just pulling me over, right? So then I kind of got kind of nervous. You know what I'm saying? Like, why, like, just why do you just want to pull me now, right? Because obviously... I'm like, this is a Dodger. Yeah, well, I mean, he knew what it was, right? Because, I mean, like, it's so clear. A BMW doesn't look like a, a Dodge Charger. And it says it on the car. Like, it'll say Charger. You know what I'm saying? So it was it was just I kind of got kind of nervous when that happened, but this is yeah, this is what we this is what we this is what we live in, man. You know what I'm saying? And my my grandpa was the first black cop in Durham here. So like it's kind of like my family has a little history of that. So um you know, it's still kind of disappointing that it's like that, you know what I mean? Uh yeah, but that's what I wanted to share with you. It's kind of it was crazy. <laughs> I was late to pick Baja because of that. <laughs> Tell Baha's ass to wait. Baha's always late, anyways. So, oh, right. but <laughs> that's what he gets. <laughs> that's what he gets. Baha's not even gonna watch this. What kind of friend? We had to bet. We, we had to ask Baha for like three weeks. Like, did you check it out? Like the first episode, he was like, no. 
Like, Marvin, it's funny that you say that, yo. Ali, let me... Oh, my gosh. We... I was just thinking about that today because I was like, yo, we had a podcast. I was like, I should ask this man if he watched our, our first episode. No, because we, we were on him because of Hunley. So listen, it's like, I, I, sometimes I look at your stuff that, you know what I'm saying? Because you look at our stuff too, right? Like it's just showing support. Like we just, sometimes I'll just look at it, watch it a bit, whatever. This man is one of like my closest. I mean like closest. He's the one that gave me the chance to play in Singapore, this guy. He hasn't watched one of our episodes not one not and we didn't say like you need to watch it just like we want your input we want you to tell us because you know us let us know what you think does it come off as this us like whatever that happens i i i feel you guys on that too i feel you on that so hard because it's happened with me and some other friends before Mm -hmm. happened with me and my boyfriend i know and i called him out so hard (laughs) just one day just staring at his face like so, which is your favorite episode? <laughs> 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 Did you like? <laughs> Just see the fear seep in. All of them, baby. <laughs> yeah. That sucks. Call them out. Call them out. I mean, we, we, ain't dog- we ain't dogging you, Baja, but we low, we low key on you right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's funny. Uh, Do it with kindness, but I think that shame them. <laughs> That's my answer for everything today. Shame them. <laughs> it's the only way you learn. <laughs> well, look, we'll make sure we get you that June bottle. Um, I don't know if there's if there's anything that you wanted to talk about or cover, but that's that's all on my end. Um, yeah, June, John, and Tom. I think we covered a lot today with with Hanley. I mean, it was a nice it was a nice conversation and. We covered everything, you guys. We talked about like life accomplishments. We hit the race card. We hit the, <laughs> we hit the, the gender card. Like, we talked about, talk about future plans, our origin story. Like, what else? Future babies. Future babies. Do I want any? <laughs> like, we got, we got intimate with this. Hit it all. We hit it yeah. all. I love it, though. I love this laid back vibe. Yes, yeah, we wanted to just make sure that we bring the people on that we. First off, mm-hmm. feel like we're gonna add, like you said about yours. We want to learn. That's mm-hmm. that's the biggest reason from starting this, right? Learn from the people that we that we have around. We don't really get to have these conversations all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Life life moves so fast paced. Sometimes you need to you need to set up a podcast to meet up with your friends, <laughs> in our own way. So, um, so beautifully cute, not true. <laughs> It's like, let's hang. <laughs> it's like, yeah, for the podcast, let's just hang. <laughs> so I'm glad we finally got it done. Thank you so much for having us in your humble abode, Han Solo. You are more than welcome, you guys. And I can't wait to listen to this when it's out. Yeah. All right, Morgan. Thank you so much for at least allowing me to see you guys. You know, I don't really get to see Navin too much. Uh, I was, actually, I was talking to him last night. I talked him into bed. Um, you kept me up is what you did. <laughs> like, this guy calls me to figure it out, like figure out whatever he has to do on his side. I'm like, bro, I'm watching a movie. Don't call me an hour before you've set up <laughs> for this practice call. Like, like I have to just mute you and turn my movie. No, nah, but I, we we appreciate you big time. Uh, we we've always wanted you on this, and we know you're you're a big uh, you're big out in Singapore, and and we're proud of what you're doing out there. You know what I'm saying? Us as your friends. Um, you know, we've, we've known, I've known you for quite a long time myself and, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure for you to come on this and, and share, you know, share your story and, and obviously for us to learn from you as well, because, you know, we're, 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 um, beginners at this and we're just trying to get better and you're definitely someone we inspire to get to, you know what I mean? Oh, guys, well, you, you got it. You're, you're going to get there, no doubt. All right, we'll keep on working at it one one bit at a time. But all right, my guy. Right. Episode four is a wrap. All right, peace out. Peace. And that just about does it for us here at the Single Point of View. So stay tuned for the next episode as we post updates and sneak peeks on our Instagram at Single Point of View. Don't forget it. Also follow us at Single Point of View on YouTube. Stay locked in on all of the full episodes as well as our short clips of each show. We'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, June, Proform Basketball Academy, and Puma, of course. Also, special shout out to the media manager, Santa, to our logo artist, Alicia Webb, 
and our advisor slash assistant executive producer, Donovan Lang. Peace.